compensation for the great and gifted That's why they looking at me crazy when I'm in the mirror I recall in the past when they passed on me Now they gotta hit the email and get the secretary clearance just to ask for me I'm a black man so I'm born to improvise Had a 9 to 5, left that and built an enterprise Basically, fellas, we, first of all, we're glad to have you guys here. Everything you guys accomplished in the city and brought to the city and continuing to bring to the city. But today's topic is, uh, like I told you guys, is, is black excellence. Both you guys are huge in your space um, and just killing the game right now. So we wanted to get started and, and discuss how, one, how you guys started. Obviously, we know your love for ball and everything you did with Rock Nation on, back on the radio now, the entertainment side. So tell us your story on how you guys started, KB. Well, I actually started with Shaka. <laughs> At the warehouse. Yeah. We used to throw parties in college and uh, yeah, the, the rest is literally history. Like yeah. we, we were, uh, you know, just uh, transplants of sorts. And uh, the AUC gave us an opportunity to, to use our people skills. And we started doing this party called Funk Clinic Fridays. I couldn't think of that name. I was thinking, yeah. I was thinking about that all night. Like, yeah. what was the name of that? Funk Clinic Fridays, and we brought literally everybody of that era and, um, you know, used the AUC as the backdrop. I mean, it doesn't get more black and excellent than the Atlanta University Center. And uh, literally, we started that together. Wow. And, and his amazing marketing skills at that time, because they had the, and he's already doing it now, but the T-shirts, the they just have a, a different 2620 T-shirt every week. Every week, yeah, new for every week. So the fact that he's doing clothing is no surprise because even back then, just from a marketing standing place, wearing that t-shirt was a, was a bad. Yeah, they used to steal them. Out of ho like, no, seriously, like the dorms, like they would have issues. People be coming outside, like, how you get that? You didn't, you know, because we, we, we got entrepreneurial with it. Obviously, it was kind of like more marketing promo for the parties, but then we had like an actual store next to Steagles. And so before we got to sell it, people, you know, had to get them from us. And people would come down the street, like, we don't know you. How do you get? But it was a thing. Fall of 90, my cousin and I both graduated high school in 91. He went to Morehouse. And I was on papers, but then he was like, dog, you got to come to Freaknik. That was my first time here, Freaknik. He said, you got to, I'm like, what is, what is a Freaknik, dog? I'm on paper, like, I'm trying to get my life together. He's like, man. Freak Nick is a black college reunion of sorts. You got to see it for yourself. I'm like, well, this your first one too. How are you selling me on something you ain't know? He ain't never been to. So long story short, man, got my, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Got my uh, PO to let me come. I was like, I'm going to look at schools. I was coming to Freak Nick. <laughs> so let, got here, dog. Technically, and, you now, technically. Yeah, technically. And it was, still on, it was still on the campus around that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I'll never forget this. The first day I came, God rest the dead, I met Shakir Stewart. Leo came up walking with Shakir Stewart. He was like, da, da, da. so Leo had already evangelized my legend. He was like, my, my, my cousin is Scarface. It's going to be a thing. And so when I got here, I knew, because back then there wasn't no social media, so people had to talk about you. Dog, I felt like I was from here. Like, I had felt, I had came, I saw so many people, because I had, like Shaka, my mom moved around a lot. I had lived in Detroit. I had lived in California. So I had people that I knew from everywhere. And Detroit was heavy, just like California was heavy. D.C. was heavy. New York was heavy. So it just it seemed like one, you know, one big family reunion. And when I went home, I was like, I got to get back to Atlanta. And that fall, I came back. So Freaknik did bring me too, bro. Staying on the beginnings, I, I'm from Atlanta. Um, born in New York, raised in Atlanta. Went to college in Huntsville, Alabama, a school called Oakland College at as well. Yeah. And uh, so, went to college, came back home. I used to go play a running shoe. And I used to see on the first court, this is where all the guys played. <laughs> this guy was beating <laughs> running shoe. And he was That's barking the whole time, barking. Ah, 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 ah. You know what I'm saying? He's the whole time. He's, High he's, socks. So I'm like, who is this guy? You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out who's this guy. It's Kenny Burns, da da da. You know what I'm saying? This is probably like 94, 95. Party, party promoter. Yeah. <laughs> this, this guy's, you know, some, something. So, you know, fast forward to going through life, and doing the parties. And as an entrepreneur, how has it been from being somebody maybe who was just a known person to somebody now that people, you know, know your face, know your fame? Know, how, how does that 
influenced on how you move in business? Uh, so, you know, coming to college and becoming a party promoter, that wasn't by design. I saw Puff do it in D.C. at Howard when I was in high school and I was in the streets, but because we was in the streets, we used to go to club. Chicago's, the Ritz, like all these clubs are like 16. So for me, it was kind of like, you know, the street guys was the real like um, inspiration for the songs, you know what I'm saying, for the lifestyle, this, that, and the third. But then the party guys had as much autonomy with the girls and the flow. So after I got locked up, I was like, I'm gonna go to Atlanta, after I came to Freaknik, I'm gonna go to Atlanta and do exactly what Puff did in DC. So there was a little surgical, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they knew me. I knew them, you know what I'm saying? But I wasn't impressed by that, like that, you know what I'm saying? Because we came with it. Y'all was trying to look like y'all had it, and it was a whole thing. But coming here, again, like, that, that's when I, it flipped. I could do that. I could do that. I could make the money, you know what I'm saying? Because I knew, like, Steve Solomon got arrested there. I knew, like, Mark Barnes. Like, and I saw the type of money they was making in my hometown. I was like, I could do that. But I, it wasn't a thought, like, I'm going to do that going to school. I just wanted to get out of D.C. because it was going to be bad. But when I got here, you know, to answer your question, like, it became a little more thoughtful. My steps became a little more thoughtful. Like, it became a little bit more surgical in, in, the, in the process. I still was wild. I still was kind of learning by trial and error, but there was a little more thought to it. And, and obviously, and I tell my mentees this all the time, you grow and you learn and you adapt and you adopt and you pivot and you continue to grow and do the same repeated cycle. Claude Austin, God rest the dead, I'm trying to give everybody they do. But Claude Austin and Dave Gates came to me in the parking lot of 112 and was like, we got this artist named Monica. We put this single out, we having trouble. Uh, we had trouble, we about to put it out again. This is the second time releasing Don't Take It Personal. So I'm looking at it kind of like, oh, we can promote that. I'm not looking at it like I could get in the music business. I could make a name from, you know what I'm saying? So that's what I mean by one, one foot in front of the other. Like we're often giving, giving signs or giving opportunities that we're just oblivious and don't really realize what it is. At this time, I took the opportunity because it was, they were offering to pay to do it, not because I could blow this girl up and I could. But literally, same parking lot I met them and they offered me the opportunity. Same parking lot I met this guy with a jerry curl. I forget this guy's name, but he had a jerry curl. But he ran the Black Expo. And the Black Expo back in the day was like Coachella. Yeah. Like for black people, like if you got on the Black Expo, yeah. you could, you know, and because Don't Take a Person was an amazing song, we ended up getting on Black Expo and came back gold. No idea that me putting those pieces together had anything to do with that. I'm just promoting doing what I do. So you and put her in the white shoes. I did, I did not. I did not. Karen, Karen Veazey, Karen Veazey or Kim Lumpkin. <laughs> um, but no, but to, to your point, I think, you know, that's all a myth when someone tells you that they had, you know, especially when you're uber successful. A lot of that shit is trial and error. A lot of that shit is by doing. That's right. So, so to his point, it's, it was weird. It's just a weird way our paths cross. Like I said, we probably synergized having moved around and having that similar story. Get to Atlanta. Atlanta is a place where spiritually you can, you can re replenish yourself. And then obviously, if you really dig in, you can create opportunity, right? If we're talking about black excellence. But it's still about the process. You know what I'm saying? And first of all, you got to visualize it. And um, I started interning. I did the uh, you know, the, the intern, the president route. Back then, intern was everything. So I was interning at BMG. I started at Jive Records. Um, and then simultaneously, I was at 89.3 WRFG. Oh, 89. Yep, a little five points. And 88.5 was in, in the market, but there was nearly no hip hop, like you said. Yeah. Um, uh, it used to be like on Sunday night or something like that, you would, it would be a certain nights you could hear a couple of Yeah, well, that, yeah, it was college radio. Yeah. Now, you know, on, on V103, you would hear top 10 with Brian Cameron, and then uh, Talib Shabazz and Lil Jon would DJ on, on yeah. Friday nights yeah. from like yeah. 10 to 1 or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So, and it, and it was still commercial. It wasn't Black Moon. No. It wasn't all the underground. So it wasn't the West Coast underground. It wasn't no Section 8 mob from, right. from D.C. It wasn't, it, 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 you know what I'm saying? RBL, Posse. I'm, I'm like, I had an original E-40. Like, we was breaking music at a level because having lived in all these places, 
I just knew the music. I knew what would work. Oh, because you've been everywhere. I lived there, so I was like, oh, I said, oh, y'all not up on this? Oh, y'all not up on, oh, y'all don't know the bounce music? Y'all don't? Right. So I, we did that, and then that transitioned into 97.5. And I remember when that station came in the market, and that was 1995, it went on the air July 5th, 1995, sure. right? Sure. And it was the, everybody wanted to be on that stage. I thought it was Hot 97 from New York. When they said Hot 97, I was like, and, and by that time, we were, by that time, 2620 was killing the, killing the streets, killing the club life. Um, you know, they would, they would come to the station and promote, you know what I'm saying? We would host things or what have you, and, and it just built. And like he said, he was moving into the, brand marketing for his, what he was doing into, to companies for artists and, and other things. And then the radio station came in and they took the whole market up. The whole market went up another level. But I remember, I want to say this, when he was there, and I think it was 95 or 96, it had to be maybe in the 95 because Reasonable Doubt came out in 96. But I remember bringing, I remember bring, go ahead. So look, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a clip, there's a clip circling the internet, and I even posted it when Jay-Z performed at my birthday party at, um, in, in Stone Mountain, at, uh, at, Atrium. at the Atrium, yeah. right? And did a whole bit, did, no, no, this is, this, I'm, I'm, I'm backing into it. <laughs> so, cause it was, you know, it was really kind of like the, the kumbaya, you know, the, 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 love, the love hug. But Jay Z, who's, who's an amazing person and, 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 has, and has transitioned to a number of different levels where he's at now, the first time I met him was through Kenny Burns. And Kenny Burns was doing, I think, street promotions or marketing for the. Yeah, I set up their street teams nationally with Ray Ray uh, and was the street team guy here in Atlanta for Rockefeller Records. So I'm at the radio station. I'm the music director, very powerful position. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't know the level of power that I had, but it was a very, and it was like the illest rap station in the country. We like past New York, past LA because- That was the beginning of Atlanta, like yeah. domination and no, seriously, in hip hop. Right, so the, it was the Gavin convention. It was, it was, a, it was a convention, it was a, hip hop conventions came in the city. Jack the Rapper or something like that? No, no, it was the Gavin, I think it was the Gavin. It was one, right? and the funny part is, because it's my friend, I remember sending out a letter to all the record reps. And I said, I knew every rapper in the, in the city was gonna be, every in the country was gonna be in the city. So I said, listen guys, please submit who you want to interview and, and we'll find a time slot for them. Right. right? So Kenny, I'm, a, I'm on the air. Kenny comes up to the station unannounced. <laughs> That's how I do. Moving to a kid. But this is my man. I don't think, I'm not thinking protocol. Exactly. So he's moving, he comes, he's like, yo, I got Woo Woo, got Jay-Z, da, da 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 I was like. Outside. Right. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I said, Woo Woo Woo, and I got these, I got a line here, and I got to clear it, and da 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 I said, I said, this is what I do. Hit me early tomorrow, and we'll schedule a time, and we'll do it tomorrow. But I got you. And that, cause that was, I think Friday. And then the next day was Saturday. One of them I said, but I got you. Right. right. And I knew who Jay-Z was. I just never met him. Right. Um, so then cool. The next day go by, he don't call. <laughs> he don't do nothing. Pops back up again. Hey, we here. <laughs> right. So mind you, this time they in the station. Right. They ain't even outside. We in the station. We ready to go. Da, da, da. I was interviewing other black moon, Somebody was there. And I had one other person, and then I said, all right, I'm gonna get you in right after this. And mind you, they, they sat in the studio. They, they sat in the studio. And so I'm sitting there, we talking, I'm, I'm doing the interview, and I even broke the mic and I said, I wanna shout out Jay-Z, he's in the city, da -da 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 -da. we got him coming up. I started doing the interview, and I guess, you know, Jay and Dave, they was like, yo, man, we ain't waiting behind, because in New York, in New York. They was all fresh off 22 twos. They, reasonable doubt was like starting to change. They number one in New York, so they like, we not, we not waiting behind these dudes. We not waiting. So they start, you know, like, yo, we not, and I remember Jay said, he's like, we not no next niggas. Because I think I broke the mic and said, yeah, Jay-Z come up next. So he was like, so then I look at Kenny, I go, yo, get your man. <laughs> 
Jamaican. <laughs> <Some Jamaican. laughs> right? And they just jumped, and then he jumped up. And, and uh, the, 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 I don't know if you even knew this. I always had a gun on me. Always. Always had a gun on me because I had heard a, 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 one, of my, my, one of my bosses told me one time he got kidnapped. To, like he was because being a music director and programming records, like people literally be like, "Yo, you gonna play my record?" You know what I'm saying? So I, I, when he told me that story, I always had a gun on me. So when they was there, and it was Jay, Dame, Tata, and Kenny. Now obviously Kenny wasn't giving me no energy, but they were just like, "Yo, yo." yo. <laughs> and you know what? Me and Tata joke about it. He's like, "He's getting stabbed." I was like, "I was getting ready to shoot you." What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and Sean Taylor was there too. It was like, so it was just a funny interaction. Obviously, through our relationship, that ended up becoming even better. We fi we fixed it. Like I, I banned his music. I was like, get him out of here. I like I'm not, they didn't play his music. Then we had to fly to New York, you know, have a little PC seating. And that's when I realized I didn't even know Chaka Pilgrim was working for him at that time. I walked in the building. I was like, what are you doing here? She was like, I work here. I was like. Oh, this is family, right? So we sat down, smoothed those waters. That same night, we went to the Muse in New York. They used to do a, a, a Monday night thing. Uh, I think it was Jessica. Oh, and Jay was like, yo, me, Biggie, a bunch of us, we all going. And so we went and hung out that night and had some fun that night. But like I said, getting to the radio station was a blessing. It was just like a series of blessings. And then one day, you know, Chris, he came, he, <laughs> Chris came to me one day because he used to come to my office all the time and ask me for information. And I would just give it to him. Like, yeah, this is what you do. This is, what, this is how you copyright, what have you. And then one day he just came to my office and was like, man, you always give me good information. You never ask me for anything. I want you to be my manager. And I never wanted to be a manager, but I said yes. I just said yes. I said, all right. I don't know why I said yes. And I, uh, I know why you said yes. Because God had a plan. God, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was with God, you know, and then the rest is history. And, 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 you know, it wasn't overnight. I managed him for four years before we got into, a, you know, try to sign him to Rockefeller, try to sign him to different places, shop the demo almost. Was I at Rockefeller? Mm, yes. No, not when you, <coughs> not when you did looking for a deal. No, that was in 98. I, cause no, 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 I wasn't there yet. Not as an executive. I mean, I was part of the... I went to Dame, um, and he was, you know, he was like the radio guy. He was like, he was like, he was like yeah, yeah, the radio guy. No, from the beef, the slight, whatever. Dame's a motherfucker. That motherfucker will hold on to some shit. I took it. We took it with a grain of salt. I just was like, and we almost did a deal with Epic, and we almost did a deal with Timberland. Um, and then we just, and then got tired of waiting and did the independent route. Again, there. There are others who did it, who do it. We're not the only ones who do it in other in other areas. But for us as a as a circle and friends, right? Not knowing that we would go into a 30 year friendship. We would right. at the moment we were young, and we were just trying to figure it out. And then, like I said, we crossed paths in multiple ways. You know what I'm saying? And supported each other in multiple ways, even subliminally. You know what I'm saying? Without necessarily saying I'm doing this for you. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Like you know what I'm saying? Bringing Jay Z to the station. Yeah, bringing Jay Z to the station. You know what I'm saying? We got a whole nother relationship and a whole, it's, it's set off of ripple effect. And then what I think when we became intentional is we started paying attention to the ripple effect, right? When you pay attention like what your actions actually do, like, you gotta be able to reflect very quickly. Like I said, being in the moment, back then I don't know if he remembers everything. I, I was a little on the outside of it, so I said, now, now we sit and we throw pictures back at each other. We're like, you remember this picture? You remember this picture? You remember this picture? You know what I mean? Like, man, man, man. And I do the same thing with Chris. Chris, because he was so in it when, you know, with the uprise that he don't remember. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm over here, like, watching, watching everything. So I, sometimes you just got to whisper, like, you remember what we did there? Right, right, right. You know, you know what I'm saying? So that's, again, now understanding that your actions have, um, have um, caused, I mean, has effects now begins to be, bring in the intentionality and say, now, I want my action to specifically benefit him. It's going to benefit others, but I said, brother, how can I help you today? Or what can I do for you? And then that becomes a very organized movement, right? And, and, and that's what people are saying is black excellence. So when you hear Nas and them say it, or you hear Jeezy say it in records, or Jay-Z or Pharrell, whoever, that's all we're talking about. And it's not the first time. We had Black Wall Street. We had Auburn Avenue. We had you know, um, Rosewood. We've, we've had these things. We've had Harlem. You know what I'm saying? We've had, so we've had these things. So we just got to get back to that. And so if, if we're talking about that and this, this global shift that is happening right now, 
um, you know, get with clusters and groups of people that are like-minded and move. And then you'll start to, that group will get with this group and we'll start aligning and it'll become this whole community. And that's what Atlanta has really become. Um, to the point now we can elect or turn the state blue. Or we'll, I, I say we're gonna have our first black female governor next year, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, uh, or 50 something years of black leadership in, in, in the city of Atlanta. And then matching that with culture and entrepreneurism and then family and structure, you know what I mean? Uh, rules and laws in the city. All right, now, okay, y'all think this is a lawless city? No, we're gonna, we're gonna show you how, this is what we expect, you know what I'm saying? For the work that we've done for 30 years. Y'all can't, y'all can't trash it like that. You can't. I, I, I wanna add to that too, and I think that like, you know, uh, I love the word trial and error because, you know, you, you learn by doing. Um, and we are, as a people, the most creative, the most naturally flamboyant. I'm talking about not trying, but come outside the light, <laughs> right? But at the same time, you know, being black excellent is being selfless. Right. And we've learned that, right? We've always done that led by that in action but like even now like you know being fathers the commonality we all have is that we're trying to set precedents for generations this is this is the bar no 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 that yeah that's history but this is the bar and i think you know um you know coming up in this game you know you're taught to have an ego you're taught to be you know boisterous and 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 the fact that you know, we've been able to see light in people, um, help amplify, you know, those things, you know, and what Shaka's done with Chris only was what Chris needed and what Shaka needed. So it was an amplification of like minds in their perspective superpowers. And I think community wise, like, you know, what I'm doing on the radio with Free Game, what I've, you know, always done with my colleagues and mentees, I tell them what I know. I don't hold back distribution. I don't hold back manufacturer. I don't hold back anything I've learned because the one thing that makes us black and excellent is that we are unique in our superpower. We are unique in our offering. And you can tell somebody everything you know, Chris, about coaching, don't mean they're going to go do the same thing. They might be in the sidelines doing all this while you sitting there like this. And the guy that sits there like this is in control. Don't get the same check as the nigga that's doing all this shit. <laughs> but that in itself, that in itself is ego. One, one of the definitions of ego is to know that you're different. You know what I'm saying? So, 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 so it's not, it's not that we're not supposed to have ego. The, what the, the, the carrot, even to the point of trial and error, is we went through those things. How Hove say so you don't have to. Hello. And the difference is, is. We, uh, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, on, <laughs> but, but, but my point is we did those things because when we came to the city, there weren't people like us that had done some things that we were trying to do and would also reach back. We're still active. You know what I'm saying? We're still talking. We're still moving. We're still relevant. You know, you, you know, whether you want to give us OG, unk, or whatever, all these, all these old, all these old colloquialisms, we still doing it. I know you guys both big in sports. Kenny, you got your line going on. Shocker from what I'm hearing the research, you still, obviously you got a ton of relationships with NBA guys yeah. where you could have probably even been a sports agent yourself exactly. with the relationships you have. I was about to say, there was a DTP sports conversation before. We had that conversation. Um, wasn't fully there. I do more consulting. I do a lot. I bring a lot of deals to guys. Like Marshawn Lynch is in town. Um, it's one of my guys that I, I do a lot. It's more consulting. Like I said, what, having work, the gift and the curse of a ludicrous mm -hmm. is he's heaven sent. Like he's so easy to work with. The headaches, headaches. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like Marshawn's not a headache, but you know, John, John Wall, CP, you know, Melo, all that. these are all my fans. So I'm able to bring deals and, 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 and do things with them, um, but I never jumped into it. One, you have to be super organized. Um, you have to be all in, you know what I'm saying? Even when, when, when Rock Nation started theirs, they, they had to go take those classes and all of that. So um, I just have, like having that great relationship and then being able to be flexible um, I, because I can use that for greater things. Um, so, I mean, yes, yeah, so I am in and around sports, but I'm not all the way in. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I love sports. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do uh, after my junior graduates from high school. 
Cause I, cause no, no, I'm gonna tell you why though. Cause I literally, at the Kennesaw State game, I, my yelling doesn't affect the sound as much as the, the high school gyms or the junior high. I'm gonna miss that. I'm gonna miss talking that shit to them refs, man. That shit is part of my DNA. And it's so funny you said that about run and shoot though, cause you know there was a main court. And, and, yeah. and we were we were hoopers. Yeah, we used to hoop three, four, five times a week, yeah. every week. Oh yeah. And late night. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We and we will fight you. <laughs> yeah. And, and we. Fight. Oh, you think them light skinned? Oh. <laughs> of we will fight you. Now we can hoop, but I love sports, man, and I think sports is one of the best ways of, uh, you know, showing, you know, leadership, um, gaining leadership, uh, learning how to uh, connect with others, um, the camaraderie, um, being selfless. Um, and basketball, you know, quite honestly, gave me the majority of my relationships that I have outside of, you know, what I did in music and, and entertainment. What you got going on nowadays, Shaka? Um, I mean, we're very consistent. Uh, my partnership with Ludacris is still growing um, and developing in a lot of different ways. So we're still doing music, still doing TV and film. Um, we're way more on the producer side now. Um, you know, so he has everything from Kids Nation to Commerce World with Netflix. Um, we have three projects in development. It's, I don't like to talk about things before they get, but things are moving on that side, obviously because of COVID, you want to pivot, so we want to do more of a producer hat. Um, but he has Fast 9 coming out this year, uh, and, we're, and we're slated to do two more of those, and then there's three other films that we're developing, one of which is also our story. Um, okay. Shows, uh, show, right? That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, we also, uh, I, I would say I found lightning in a bottle again, I've managed a number of different artists, so I still, I'm still passionate about music. I mean, I, I have childish major. Um, I have a, a, a writer named um, Jr. Uh, R&B singer and writer Jr. Um, I consult a lot of people, kind of like, you know, humbly the Godfather. I just like to make sure I, I, you know, I look at I look at contracts and make sure and just I just try to help people because I just want them to be better than I was 20 years ago. I just I just I just want to be. I just want them to be better than I was 20 years ago and not make the same mistakes that I made 20 years ago. That would be the dumbest thing in the world to me. Um, but I did find lightning in a bottle uh, where I did start managing a new client which by the name of Pinky Cole, uh, and I'm an investor in Slutty Vegan. So, um, so yeah, so I manage her. Cut the check. <laughs> Sloppy toppy. Hussy fussy. So um, that, and that also, and that, and that birthed out of you know, me and Luda also have chicken and beer in the airport. So these things are just like very, very, sh you know, short leaps or steps from and continuations of things that we've already been doing, but they're getting bigger. Like I said, more intentional, more knowledge, more resources. Um, and then the last thing that I will say, one, I'm, I'm definitely going to be working on a book. I had to get myself into the space of where I want to tell any part of my life. Um, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of healing, a lot of healing and a lot of reflection that needed to be done. I just turned 51, so I was like, all right, let me, let me, let me start leaving some, some breadcrumbs. But the new space that I'm in, and I've been challenged by my team, is the VC world. I've been able to access a lot of rich folks, <laughs> uh, quite a few billionaires uh, in the Rolodex. And you just, I just took my time creating those relationships because you know, I was doing, you want to bring the right thing. Right. And I've been successful in bringing a few cap tables, you know, creating a few cap tables for some, for some um, businesses. Um, Honey Pot being one, Slutty Vegan being another, you know, Wingstop Investment, a few other things that I've done. And there's two more that's getting ready. One, Wingstop. you know what I mean, uh, that is coming. And I've just developed a, a really good uh, record. And so my guys uh, have challenged me to start my own VC fund, which I'm working on now, to raise $150 million in capital to invest in, in black businesses and in, 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 in small businesses. You know, as Shaka said, man, I, I, I have been blessed to take a, a lot of brands to the mountaintop. Um, in 2017, I had the pleasure of meeting Fawn Weaver. 
um, through uh, a VC that was doing a Series A raise. Um, I was able to get some equity in Uncle Nearest, which is the fastest growing independently owned American whiskey in U.S. history. Um, just had a crazy evaluation, um, generational money, and um, I'm happy to be a part of that. Um, and then I am investing in a new uh, cream called LS Cream Liqueur. Um, my wife and I just bought 10% of the company and uh, we will be relaunching that in May. It's already out, LS Cream Liqueur. Um, go to uh, Reserve Bar or Drizzly and see where it's at near you. These are the old bottles we are rebranding. Best yeah. bottle in the game. Black and white. Um, it's what? Black and white bottle. Black and cream. Black and cream. Yes, sir. Um, and then we have BRNS, my son's clothing line, which is our family business. Uh, be real, never sell out. It's a play on our last name. And um, it has everything to do with athletics and sports, you know, from the competitive nature to the style. Uh, we've embodied that with BRNS, and we've probably released 10 collections, 12 collections now. We have an all black crew love collection coming out February 19th, and uh, we're going to sell out in two days. So I suggest you get active um, when you see the launch. And, you know, just continuing the radio show with Kenny Burnshaw. I was blessed enough in the pandemic to. Uh, go on my Instagram live and have necessary conversations with my industry colleagues and inspire people to, uh, you know, double down on their dreams. I've taken that to V103 as of August 17th. Um, number one, number one in the market. Um, I haven't done radio since 2012. Um, so coming back in and it'll be number one five, six months later is a hell of a feat. And I just want to grow that. I'm, I'm a Steve Harvey, this motherfucker. That's right. uh, and get everything I came for. And that's one of the uh, the reasons, or the main reason, why I wanted to get you guys on the show is basically give you guys your flowers now rather than later. That's the, the whole purpose of on set, um, sports, entrepreneurship, and technology. Obviously, Kenny, you know everything I have going on. Shaka, I know you don't know too much. It was just a phone call, yo, I need you on the show. And that was through uh, Tani and Xavier and a couple other people just connecting the dots. Um, but that's one of the reasons I started Seven Group, or we started Seven Group, was uh, legacy. The biggest thing is leaving something for our girls. Um, I brought the first college basketball event to the city in 20 years at State Farm. If it wasn't for COVID, it would have sold out. Kenny did the uh, release video, the announcement, bringing it to the city, had some of the best teams in the country, and will continue to do that. Um, and even pulling it off in COVID, because like I always say, when you look like us, you don't get a chance to cancel. Yeah, so um, that's the reason why we started Seven Group and bringing holiday hoops giving to the city. It's going to be obviously pulling off in the COVID, just setting the tone for 2021. Kenny, you be involved again, I'm, Uncle Nears. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Nears being a black-owned whiskey. Um, and we, I wouldn't even be able to do it without Citizen Trust Bank, a black-owned bank, um, giving me the line of credit to even just live life and get, get it off the ground and have some of the best teams in the country from like Kentucky and LSU and Auburn and Clemson. And so we got more coming. More coming. We gotta, we'll got we have Baylor and, and Memphis again next year, Auburn again next year, um, and just bringing something to the city that's black-owned. Because when right. you turn that TV on, it's nothing but us playing it. But behind the scenes in Atlanta, football and all the major events, they don't look like that. So that's the dream what, is real. The, exactly, the dream is real, and that's what that's what we we started the show on set is about is just getting giving you guys your flowers now. Um, we are in talks with Honey Pot. We are in talks with Pinky to get her on the show as right. well, and just what people are doing in the city, not only just the city but the state. And this is just a Black History Month project that we wanted to pull off and, and probably continue to grow into the months coming. And that's what we wanted to get you guys here for. Um, obviously, we appreciate you taking your time out of your day because you both are very busy and accomplishing a, a lot of, uh, of shit right now. Major things, not just for people that look like us, but for the city as a whole. And we're very appreciative of that. So we definitely appreciate it. I know you got to catch a flight. So this is us wrapping it up. And that's pretty much it, guys. And we want to thank Highland Cigar also. Highland Cigar. Yes, Highland Cigar. yes. Thank you, guys. Highland Cigar Lounge is black owned as well. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to have it here is to continue to uh, support black businesses as well, right? All right, guys, that's it. Thank you.